early 905 and uh and the numbers are looking good um we'll get going um and i want to introduce beth francis who's going to kick it off for us our ceo of the essex county community foundation she's going to kick it off and and uh, welcome folks and give a little context to uh what we're talking about today thanks beth thanks stratton um i i guess I, i'd like to start off by um just with everything we do at the community foundation we do this work with our partners um, who allow us to, um, to focus on certain issues and work on the things that we do. So I wanted to say a thank you to all of our lead partners who support our work and our community leadership effort. You see some of them here. You'll see some of them on the next slide as well. Um, and uh, attacking a challenge like the digital divide doesn't happen without a lot of the people who allow us to do this work. So I just wanna say thank you to all of them. Um, let's get started uh, to, to frame today. Um, I'd just like to share with you a little bit about our community foundation's response to COVID-19 because what we're gonna talk about was born out of our COVID um, relief and response from the community foundation. And so I'll just give you a high level overview of what we've done um, here at the foundation to um, have an impact during COVID-19. And we did this in three areas first, um, we raised over $7 million and deployed almost all. Um, we're at $6.8 million deployed to 266 grants um, that, uh, that had an impact in 129 nonprofits that were doing vital work in the face of COVID for vulnerable families in our county. Um, you can learn more about um, the deployment of those on our website. Uh, every grant round that we did is listed there and the impact of that giving. Um, but clearly a large portion of our response was about raising resources and deploying resources. The second area of our COVID response was really about our connections um, with people in the nonprofit, small business and funding community. We're often the hub of communication for all three of those um, groups, especially related to data and funding opportunities, both inside and outside of the, the foundation. Um, so our work here during COVID um, uh, was really about connecting resources and trainings on PPP and PPE supports, as well as technical assistance. Um, it was a big part of what we did during COVID. Um, I also really, uh, what about what today is really about, I guess, is the response in our COVID community leadership work. Um, for those who might not be familiar with our mission in this area, it's about understanding our region's data, bringing cross-sector leaders together to address root causes to big issues. And in many cases, it's also about investing philanthropic resources on solutions that can really scale to greater impact in solving challenges that are affecting our communities. And really, this is what today is about. Um, back in May, we held two Zoom convenings with 80 sector leaders to help emerge ideas that would really build a stronger system in our region in the aftermath of COVID. So we, we brought these 80 folks together. They are people, they are funders, they're community leaders, they're nonprofit leaders. Um, and we really discussed lots of ideas in this Think Lab um, that, were, that we could address together to become stronger on the other side of COVID. Um, Stratton, can you advance the slide for me? Um, and so for us, the, that um, there was significant consensus that came out of those think labs, particularly around the digital divide, that it was a significant issue and that we were committed at the Community Foundation to understanding what the data was around that. And we began with a study on how the digital divide impacts our communities and who is most effective. Um, so while we produce the report that you're gonna learn about today, um, it's the data that we felt was helpful, not only for our own learning, but could be useful to the community as a whole. So today is about sharing that report with you. Um, and so to do that, I'm gonna turn this session over to Evan Horowitz. Um, he is our partner in the study. Uh, he leads the Center for State Policy Analysis at Tufts University's Tisch College of Civic Life. Um, and so Evan is going to actually lead us through the next phase of our learning. Thank you, Beth. Hi, everybody. Uh, good to see 
It's good to see lots of people this morning, though mostly what I'm seeing is Stratton's screen and uh, my notes. So forgive me if you're waving at me or putting a thumb up or raising your hand. Um, better to have the questions in the chat, more likely to get seen and noticed. Uh, as Beth mentioned, my name is Evan Horowitz. I was a data journalist. I was the resident data journalist at the Boston Globe from 2014 to 2018. And I left the Globe at the end of 2018 to start um, the Center for State Policy Analysis, which aims to provide nonpartisan analysis of live legislative issues. So if the legislature is working on something, we want to do an analysis of it. We've just released a couple of analyses of the ballot questions too. So those of you who have your absentee ballots in front of you on the desk and are wondering how to vote on question one or question two, uh, check out our ballot guide. Uh, we won't tell you how to vote. That's not our job, but we'll give you all the information you need to make those kinds of decisions. And so that's our core mission, but, but outside of our core mission, we also you know, work with organizations like ECCF to make sure to, to help ferret out the best data for tackling important problems across the Commonwealth. Um, and I was at those think labs uh, that Beth mentioned in May. And you know, afterwards I called, uh, I called uh, Stratton and I said, you know, hey, I heard a lot of people talking about this digital divide stuff. Do you, you know, are you interested in seeing what data is available? And, and he said, well, we were just gonna call you. Uh, so, I mean, it seemed like a, a natural thing to pursue and there is you know, a lot of data available on the topic. Having said that, it became clear pretty quickly that data analysis was going to be just the first phase of this project. And that to be really useful, we're gonna to have to do some combination of quantitative and qualitative analysis. So we set out the three phase plan, which you're seeing on the slide. The phase one was using the best available data to map the digital divide across the county, within cities, towns, key subgroups, neighborhoods. Um, and I should say, I'm not gonna talk about this a lot today. It's not a big part of the presentation, but um, it may be a big part of people's planning moving forward. So I should say, we were able to push this analysis down to the neighborhood level, so the, the block group level, for people who know their census data. So for any given city or town, we can actually say a lot more about where exactly people are struggling to access digital resources. Um, we could tell you sort of what streets they're living on, um, you know, and yeah, exactly, and what the map looks like around them, if they're near parks, things like that. Um, so having gotten the data together, we moved to phase two. We spent several weeks on the phone with people who have a deep understanding of how these issues are playing out in communities across the county and how they're material, materializing in areas like schools, telehealth, senior centers, and beyond. And, you know, those conversations were vital for giving some context to the data and uh, getting a sense of the whole things we weren't seeing, but needed to see and needed to think about. And in phase three, well, that's, that's today, uh, integrating findings into a report that we can share um, to help leaders understand the divides and, and catalyze change. Uh, thinking about this, it, it occurs to me that there probably should be a phase four, um, because as I know Beth mentioned, and, and will probably get mentioned again, uh, this is not the end point, this is a pivot point. Uh, to precisely the kinds of discussions about fomenting and catalyzing change moving forward. Um, so phase three is not the last phase, it's just the phase that we're up to uh, so far. Um, so uh, let's say next slide. I hate saying that, forgive me for like saying that it sounds like a command, but I just don't have control of the screen and, and people are watching. Um, so we treat the dig digital equity as a multi-dimensional issue right, with four core elements. And they are access, and that means uh, secure, affordable broadband, uh, equipment, a modern desktop, laptop with a camera, and privacy, which is a comfortable working and learning space. Like if you can't, if you have a great computer and solid, uh, reliable broadband access, but you don't have a room where you can close the door or headphones so you can tune out other people, it's very hard to make the best use of the digital world. Uh, and training to build skills and comfort. And it's really, in addition to skills and comfort, it's also kind of resilience. People who work on computers know things are gonna go wrong. Things go wrong. Um, and if you don't have some kind of basic resilience to address problems, it's gonna be very hard to live a sort of, kind of full digital life. Now, some of these things are well and regularly measured like access, um, and to a lesser degree, equipment. Uh, so a lot of the numbers we've assembled today fit under those two headings. But I just want 
I, I need to be wary and I want people hearing to be wary of the, the old joke about the person who's looking for their keys under the lamppost, even though they drop them across the street. And the friend asks, why are you looking over here if you drop them over there? And the answer is, because this is where the light is. Um, it's very easy to get stuck in this kind of problem where you're looking where the light is because that's the data you have, not because that's the most important problem that needs to get solved. And the access and equipment, that's where the light is uh, in this world. But it's not necessarily where you find all the keys to addressing the digital divide and building towards digital equity. Um, and I should say of these four things, they're not always strongly interlapping. So access and equipment do fit together. Very often people who lack access also lack equipment, but privacy is a very different thing and training can be a very different thing. Um, so it's important to think about them as, I mean, this is one reason I call it multidimensional, as, as really different dimensions um, that need to be measured separately. Um, one, I'm not gonna quote anyone directly, I won't say a name, because uh, I you know, haven't vetted all of these quotes, but one, someone said something as part of our interviews that I really liked, um, which was, e even if you were able to wave a magic wand and give people a high quality computer and wave another to give people broadband, you'd still have all these other issues to deal with. You'd still have to accompany it with tools for learning how to access and use the technology and a room of one's own um, for making sure you can do so securely. So next slide, yeah. So here's the big picture, well, two big pictures, actually. Uh, what you're looking at are town by town maps of the first two dimensions that we talked about. So on the left is the share of households with cable or fiber broadband, so not including cell phone uh, internet. On the right is the share with a basic desktop or laptop. Um, before we zoom in though, I want, to look, I want you to look at the headlines because we're talking about some big numbers. One of every five households in both cases lack either a basic computer or at least some kind of lo low speed cable fiber internet connection. That's 60,000 households in the county home to around 160,000 people. Um, and it's, it's usually keep that in your head give a sense of scale. This is not a marginal problem unless you think of the margins as taking up 20% of the space. Um, so it, this is a problem that really crosses from margins and is bleeding into a large section of the, of the page, um, this map of the county and needs to be thought of in that way. So of course the digital deserts are not evenly distributed around the county. What you see highlighted in the dark blue are the cities and towns with the lowest rates of broadband access and computer ownership. And you'll note that they are quite similar across the two maps. Um, you're talking about Lawrence and Lynn and Haverhill and Salem and um, Gloucester, um, places that you might have expected because some of the cities that are struggling most economically or who are most economically disadvantaged are those with the biggest problem. Now there was a time, and there's still places in the country where the digital divide is a supply issue that is driven by the lack of availability of options for secure broadband. You think of kind of across rural America, this is still a major issue. And there's a little of that left in Essex County, but mostly we're dealing with the demand issue. This is a cost problem. Broadband is expensive, so is equipment. Privacy requires extra space and housing is expensive. Uh, as a result, the digital divide often aligns with other divides around poverty, secure housing, jobs. And this is something we heard repeatedly in our interviews, namely that you can't separate the challenge of the digital divide from those other entrenched issues of social and economic equity. Uh, However, before we jump to the next slide though, I, I do wanna say that that's not the only way to think about it. Um, and what you'll see is that while it's true that kind of the overall rates do seem to align with what you might, with the sort of general economic patterns across the county, that's not true for a lot of the subgroups. And that's what we're gonna look at for the next couple of slides. A few select subgroups, including low-income families, Latino families, kids, and seniors. And in each case, we're interested in two things. First, where those groups are struggling, that is what towns, or where you find the sort of um, poorest access to digital resources among low-income families, for instance. And two, where you see the biggest gaps between subgroups and the rest of the local population. And that's a different thing, right? It may be that, you know, uh, low-income families in Lynn are faring quite badly, but the overall population is also really struggling with digital equity issues. However, there are towns where low-income families are doing badly while the rest of the town is faring quite well and having no problem getting with broadband access or computer ownership. So you have to think of these separately uh, and we're interested in 
both. Um, yeah, so we'll go to the next slide. So this is the slide for low-income families. And before I get into the details of what that means, just jump to the table. What the table is showing are the towns where families earning less than $35,000 a year have the lowest rates of broadband access. That's the, I guess, orange column on the right. And what the middle column shows is what the overall broadband rate is in that town. And you can see in some of these towns, there are some very big gaps in Merrimack, in Groveland. You know, these places are faring quite well overall in terms of broadband access, but there are also places where low-income families are really struggling uh, with access. And, you know, that's, that's just the beginning of, you know, one of the things we sort of unearthed in this data is that there really are areas where every town can improve. There's some subgroup, there's some neighborhood that is lagging and where interventions could be really uh, targeted and effective. Um, I do want to say a few things about the data here. The $35,000 a year cutoff, it's household income. And it's, it's always hard to know exactly where to set a cutoff like this. Uh, who counts as low income? Should it be the poverty line, which would be closer to kind of $25,000? Should it be more like twice the poverty line and get you sort of deeper into the kind of middle class, the $50,000? Um, well, you know, the picture actually wouldn't change much if we changed the cutoff. We chose 35K in part because um, it's one of the easier to places to, to cut off the data, uh, but also it, it, it's a sensible place to do it. It's about one and a half times the poverty rate. It's higher than the annual income on the minimum wage. So it does include a lot of working class families, not just um, families in deep poverty. And it encompasses a lot of families. That is, this is not a small group earning less than $35,000 a year. Um, in every case, it's greater than 10%. It's almost always above 15 to 20% of the population. So small sample sizes are not doing the work here. We're talking about substantial uh, swaths of the populations. And I'll add that the converse of this is also true, um, which is to say middle and high income residents fare well, do, are doing well in terms of broadband access, regardless of where they live, right? If you're, a and you don't even have to get pretty, you don't have to get very high up the income ladder. Families with incomes above $75,000 a year have 90% or higher rates of broadband in virtually every city in town. Right? The, it really is a pretty stark differentiating uh, factor there. Um, Evan, yeah. can I, there's yeah. just, there's one question I think that might be helpful to answer now, which is where does this, the data sources for the maps come from? Um, so maybe you can just, uh, sure. I know it's at the end as well, but maybe just to frame it here. Um, so uh, this is all um, census data from the American Community Survey. They do, this is the five year um, survey. Well, they do it every year, but when you need data about towns, you know, at this level or the block group, you work with the five-year numbers. So this data is actually 2014 to 2018. Having said that, um, one of our early concerns was, would these five-year numbers be a little outdated then since this changes pretty quickly? We were able to check the 2018 numbers against a one-year sample for some of the bigger towns and the changes are very small. Um, so pretty confident that these are still reflective numbers uh, and they do come from the Census Bureau's American Community Survey. You think that answers the question, Beth? Great. Um, Sorry, yes, thank you, I was on mute. <laughs> no, no, great. Okay, so uh, next slide. Are we on the next slide? Yeah. So um, this slide and another subgroup here, we're talking about Latino families. Uh, and again, you can jump to the table to see the kind of big takeaway. We're looking at something similar, which is the broadband access rate among Latino, uh, actually it's among Latino residents, it's not families in this case, um, as compared to the broadband access rate for white non-Latino residents. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about those census designations in a second, but uh, again, the key takeaway here is these towns don't exactly align with the towns that are most economically disadvantaged or the ones that are highlighted uh, earlier in an earlier slide. Um, there are definitely some substantial gaps in places where you might you might not expect, not necessarily expect. Uh, and across the county, I do wanna clarify that first bullet, across the county, Latino residents are twice as likely to lack broadband access compared to their white 
non-Latino neighbors. Uh, and that's a way of saying that, you know, generically, the white uh, non-Latino access rate is close to 90% and the Latino rate across the county is close to 80%, so about tw tw twice as many Black. Um, again, I, I said I was going to say something about these categories. Um, so Latino in the census data is not a racial classification, right? It's an ethnic classification that cuts across racial categories. So um, you can be in census data, Latino and white, Latino and black, Latino and um, multiracial. Uh, so the way we've structured this, it's Latinos of any race and the comparative group white non-Latino, that's white residents who do not, but white by race, who do not identify as Latino, right? So there's no overlap. Otherwise, if you do Latinos and whites, there's actually overlap between the categories because there's a substantial number of white Latino residents and families. Uh, unlike with lower income families, in this case, we do need to be more mindful of sample sizes because not all towns across the county have substantial Latino populations. So this table is limited to towns with at least 3% uh, Latino populations. That's still um, can be relatively small, but it's meaningful at 3%. I should say we don't talk in the slide, but language barriers are an additional hurdle to think about uh, for Latino families. It's something we heard um, from folks on the ground when we, when we spoke to them. You know, even if you have reliable internet, a working computer, and a room of your own, it's, it's no good if you primarily speak Spanish and the resources you need to access are only available in English. Um, I know from talking to folks that this happened with PPP loans early in the COVID crisis, where there were Latino businesses eager to apply for these loans, but the early available information about how to apply while what was online and accessible, but only in English, um, and the instructions in the webinar. So it took a little bit of time. This is another dimension uh, of the digital divide um, that's especially pertinent here. I should also say, we did look at broadband access and computer ownership among black families uh, but in many areas, the population sizes are really small and the information is therefore noisy and unreliable. Um, there are, however, towns, if you, if you live in a town where there is a more substantial black population, we do have those numbers and would be happy to share and discuss. Uh, next slide. So, We've combined kids and seniors on this slide, but I'm gonna separate those out, starting with the kids. The kids have been the beneficiaries of the biggest, most concerted effort thus far to boost digital equity in Essex County and beyond. And, and I'm thinking here of the push to distribute Chromebooks to students for remote learning. It was a, it was a hasty process to be sure and an incomplete one, but it also points to the scale of what can be accomplished very quickly with focus and even a moderate um, amount of resources. At the same time, the distribution of Chromebooks also exposed other challenges, including some of the ones we've been discussing. They're no good if you don't have secure internet access, and it's not enough to give every family one if there are three kids in the family who need them, or if you have a level of broadband that only allows you to do one video conference at a time and, and all three kids are supposed to be doing remote learning at the same time. So this is a point we heard from, um, from uh, state rep um, Minkucci, who said, said to us, uh, saying at the Lawrence Public Schools that they, quote, so did the best they could with the resources they had to ensure each household received one device, uh, close quote. But, but noting, she noted quite quickly thereafter that you know, one device only gets you so far, it's not even enough equipment and it doesn't address any of the other issues. So uh, for instance, the real privacy issue for kids, especially for older kids, I mean, this is something we heard from teachers and advocates during our interviews. It's not comfortable, it's often not comfortable for preteens and teens to share their home life with the world, which is what happens when you're learning remotely and you don't have a door to close. Your friends, your teachers, they see what your house is like, what your family is like. And you know, there's nothing more embarrassing for a teenager than other people seeing what their families are like. Um, and you know, it sounds like a kind of a joke, but it also was a real problem if teenagers are therefore turning off their videos or um, not participating in remote learning. Um, no, we don't have a table or chart here for the kids. Uh, one reason is you don't really see unique hotspots when it comes to kids. Their access patterns match the overall patterns, which makes sense because the digital fortunes of kids are so tied to those of their parents. Um, they don't you know, differentially purchase broadband or computers, or very rarely do. Um, so sticking with this slide, the seniors, um, things look different for seniors. 
because their access patterns are quite different. They fare worse everywhere when it comes to digital access. And while part of that may be generational discomfort, part of it is also about stigma, uh, which is something that we heard from many of the senior care folks we talked to. So people tend to underestimate both the potential for seniors to improve their familiarity with digital resources and uh, perhaps more important, the potential gains that could accrue from this familiarity. In addition to the learning possibilities, there are, so you could think if they did have access, there are things, you know, there are lectures, there are classes to take. There are also social possibilities for those who are struggling with isolation or struggling with mobility. And increasingly there's telehealth, uh, which could make it vastly easier for seniors to check in with medical professionals about routine care and questions. Telehealth has been working relatively well, um, at least that's what we heard in talking to folks. A uh, couple of reasons for that. One is the quick change in reimbursement rates um, by insurance companies made a huge difference in access to telehealth. But the other is that it doesn't actually require, it, it's not as demanding from a resource perspective as remote schooling is. You don't need five or six hours of dedicated uh, internet plus a, you know, plus a computer that you can control. You need 20 to 40 minutes of online time to connect with your doctor, which can be more manageable. And again, helping seniors is, a, is another of these multifaceted issues that requires equipment, access, privacy, and what's especially important for this community, training. Uh, next slide. So there are some unique features of the digital divide that merit special attention. Um, this is a Zoom call, it's the first one, the Catch-22. This Zoom call that we're all on right now, one thing we can be pretty sure of is that people who are struggling to access digital resources are going to be underrepresented among us, right? <laughs> they may not be here at all. Partly that's a function of education and interest, but it's also because if you don't have reliable internet access, you can't log in to tell us about it. Right? And this makes it very hard to fully identify and understand this population because so many modern assessment and communications tools are online. You can't run an online survey to see, survey to see why people are struggling with internet access. You can't send out a mass email announcing an event or a training on the topic. These strategies don't, won't work. You can't do a remote training at all um, because you, that requires people to be able to access the remote training, which is what you're training them for, uh, hence the Catch-22 title of the problem. Um, there are also some intersecting equity questions that need to be carefully disentangled. So one thing we heard talking to experts was the degree to which the digital divide follows the contours of existing equity challenges around housing, poverty, uh, pollution. These things are not separable and there's a really daunting implication that you might have to attack and solve them all together. But we also heard something different, which is that these lines don't always overlap and there are times when the digital divide is essentially forging a new kind of inequity. As an example, we heard from a few school folks that turn out for remote Kind of school parent meetings has been really remarkable, not just in terms of numbers, but in terms of diversity. You can attract all manner of people who had in the past been too busy or lacked childcare, uh, had like jobs with uh, you know extensive hours and couldn't attend in person. All right, so these there is a group of people who can attend remote, you know, meetings, remote events, who couldn't attend uh, in person. At the same time, there is one group who definitely can attend, and that's those who lack secure digital access um, along the dimensions we've been talking about. And you see something similar with kind of government programs. There are a number of programs that have migrated their applications online, which is a lot easier for a huge swath of people. So it cuts down on lines, it cuts down on overhead. I mean, it's genuinely more efficient for a substantial swath of the population and not just those who are, are well off. However, the more appealing this becomes and the more resources get shifted from in-person service to online service, the greater the burden for those who don't have secure online access. Um, so you create this new exclusion focused on those who lack equipment, access, privacy, and training. Uh, at this point, I'm gonna hand back to Stratton, unless you wanna do any data specific questions now, um, but I leave that to others to decide. Um, and Stratton is gonna shift the discussion from issues to, to opportunities. Terrific, and, and uh, that's a good point. Is there any any questions that popped up in the chat, um, you know, that, that we want to talk about right now? I know I saw one question, um, Evan, was talking about Salem specifically. So um, 
on the um, on the uh, the the map slide um, here. It talks the, about. I can read the sorry. question, Stratton. Just yeah, to help I, I, you I got, out I, while, while you yeah, find I, the slide. It says yeah, I'm confused yeah. by the relationship between this and the earlier slide showing 62 percent to 79 percent of Salem households having limited broadband access. This is showing 75 to 80 percent do have do have access. So there are a couple of different. This is the technical thing. Um, so I'm happy to talk about it. It seems like it might be a distraction for a lot of people, but there are two things going on. One is uh, one is a household measure, and the other is a resident measure. So those are different, right? One's a per person measure. And the other is that when you're just talking about overall, when you start looking at subgroups like white, non-Latino and Latino, you're picking out subgroups. So there may be a subgroup not reflected on this slide that has a very low rate that's pulling down the overall rate. So um, I'm happy to look at the numbers. This is, so this is the kind of question that we can answer. If you're interested, we can answer in detail and I would be happy to answer in detail, um, but it, it'll be great. We'll, we'll dig through the numbers. Well, I think the subgroup um, piece was the key differentiation there, Evan. You know, when you look at it by subgroup, that's where you see the discrepancies. And I think that's what you're trying to call out in that in that slide specifically around uh, Latinos. Um, okay, so please continue to add other questions. We'll we'll capture them and we'll come back and and, um, and talk about those. We're going to shift now to talk a little bit about more about the opportunities. Where do we go from here? Um, and I just want to say thanks to Evan um, for the review of the the current state of the digital divide. Um, the discussion on the key themes. Uh, we've enjoyed working with Evan. It's been a great partnership and, and collaboration. And, uh, and thank you for your diligence and, and thoroughness in this task um, and working with us on it. Um, and I think you've set the table uh, pretty nicely as, as a good start here. And you know, as we reflect on the, the urgency of remote learning uh, for youth and, and adults that are learning, uh, the growing evidence and demand for telehealth and the need for all workers and businesses, small businesses too, to embrace a digital perspective, now just may be our best opportunity to address the digital divide in Essex County. Uh, now may be our opportunity. Um, this existed before, but it's exposed now. Um, the water has gone down and the rocks are, are showing and now may be our opportunity. So, so where do we start? Um, uh, you, know, uh, you know, what's needed is a right mix and balance of both local and regional efforts. And we tried to show that in some of the data, local opportunities and regional efforts, uh, as well as bold long-term initiatives and sharp near-term actionable interventions. So balancing those two, those two uh, parts there. All working together to improve broadband access, distribute equipment, expand training, and open up safe spaces for virtual activities. And let's really think about these four core elements and dimensions that, that Evan talked about in the digital divide um, up here on the slide, uh, access, equipment, privacy, and training. And you know, what we're gonna do now is talk you know, look a little bit about how to explore what the possibility is in each of these areas and what can be. So with access specifically, um, let's talk about you know, some of the opportunities there and increasing and providing access. Um, and so when we talk about ensuring complete and cost-effective access to the internet, um, for my lens, this breaks down into two primary areas of opportunity. Uh, first is creating new approaches um, for access, new approaches to, to access the internet that not only create broader reach to those not served, but of equal importance is that these new approaches can create competition and a more robust marketplace resulting in more choice and ideally lower costs. In many cases, in a lot of our communities, uh, there's only one provider um, available. Second, uh, on the other side, is working with existing approaches and existing providers um, and working to reduce costs and collaborate to expand current reach to all of our community. And there's been a lot of discussion uh, uh, on both of these tacks across the county as well as nationally. For municipal broadband specifically, um, you know, again, giving some detail on the opportunities here, cities including Haverhill, Salem, Lawrence, um, probably many others are exploring, testing, and looking into the feasibility of the many municipal network approaches. There's many options out there. Um, and so, you know, a question that we pose to the group here today and that we'll continue to ask is, how can we learn from each other's learnings and efforts? How can we explore cross municipal and regional solutions? Or at a minimum, can we collaborate in planning and analysis efforts? Are there opportunities there? For the public Wi-Fi, 
Um, and this is making sort of Wi-Fi available to the public. Uh, both Portland, Maine and Portland, Oregon uh, are examples of cities providing public Wi-Fi to their main streets and downtown areas. So this becomes a public amenity that consumers, residents and businesses all can benefit from, free Wi-Fi. Can this be a differentiator for your community in recruiting customers or businesses uh, or residents? Can this be a cost savings? You know, what kind of cost savings can this even produce for those? And how expensive is this to do as we reflect upon this as an opportunity for our different sort of main street areas? The final area as we talk about access is subsidized accounts or partnering with your current internet provider um, where you know, is another fast way to increase access and reduce costs. Can we subsidize access in some way through the current mechanisms? You know, many leaders have worked to you know, renegotiate cable franchise agreements and partner with their providers to provide reduced rate access for schools or elderly um, or other uh, populations. And so we ask ourselves, you know, when was the last time you know, we reviewed our cable franchise agreement? Are there effective ways to negotiate that we could learn from experts or neighbors? What are creative programs that providers are offering today, nationally, locally, or perhaps working with them to partner and they're willing to pilot locally? Now is a good time to be having these conversations with providers as they are well aware that the digital access and the service they provide is as important to our society as ever. So now as we continue to sort of think about opportunities, let's think about equipment. And what does it mean when we talk about opportunities for equipment and understanding sort of meeting some of these digital uh, inequities? So let's talk about, you know, making equipment available to all. There's been a lot of terrific grassroots efforts in supplying hardware and tablets to students of all ages and elderly across the county. In Lawrence, the senior center led by Martha Velez and in partnership with many local nonprofits is providing tablets and training to seniors in the city. Cities and towns have made sure that students, you know, throughout their different school systems have had access to digital hardware and Wi-Fi hotspots during this distance learning time. But is this a challenge that could be easily overcome? Can we size the challenge by number of devices needed and focus efforts in each of our communities and fund and implement these solutions? When we think about our neighborhoods and communities, is this solvable? You know, to some of the data that Evan was showing, is this actually solvable when we think about our communities? What would Essex County look like if we could provide an affordable computing device and the training to use them to all of our families and residents? Likewise, can we leverage corporate partnerships to capitalize on donated hardware, training, and volunteerism in our communities? What are the possibilities there? Again, thinking locally, working with the local organizations, what are the opportunities there? And finally, can we create a digital equity fund that funds these efforts across the county? When you look at the city of Boston has a digital equity fund, Seattle has a digital equity fund, Portland with a digital fund, and even the Cleveland Community Foundation has a digital equity fund. What do we need to do to build enthusiasm around such an effort here in Essex County? What can we do to create an equity fund to help fund these many efforts? On the privacy front, you know, as, as Evan said, you know, the sort of equipment and access parts are a little bit more tangible and measurable. But on the privacy front, what else can we do? You know, as discussed, having a safe private place to work is incredibly important to be able to capitalize on the broadband, Wi-Fi, and hardware you might be lucky enough to have. And you know, Evan talked about some of the, the sort of feedback that we've gotten from the community. Um, and in talking to sort of Caleb Dolan of KIPP, you know, he talked about, you know, again, this particular challenge of adolescents who feel very anxious on video um, in, in the, you know, in working with learning tools um, and the impact that that image, you know, can present on them. And that results in lack of engagement and increased stress. And I've seen a lot of chats on this also, right? This black box concept, you know, people don't want to engage. Um, and that's a real, real issue. And it's not just youth. That's, that's many folks, elderly and others too, that extends across the community. Um, and so as we think about that, as we think about the opportunities and we start to sort of think broader and how we can support our communities to eliminate these issues, you know, we can ask the questions, you know, can we retool community sites to be safe internet access areas or work centers? 
at libraries, YMCAs, senior and community centers. And I know a lot of this is already happening, but we can sort of start to think about this across the different community access points. Can we distribute headphones and microphones? You know, as one form of privacy. You know, these are super cost effective and may deliver huge privacy value. And, you know, can we also, you know, sort of reach out and get more general outreach and build our awareness and listen to understand the populations and those impacted by this, to understand these privacy issues better and help collaborate to solve them. Now, that's one of the real limitations in this COVID world that we're living in, is you can't even go out and talk to people to understand the issues. And, and Evan talked a little bit about some of that catch-22, how do you even get some of this information? But that's an area around privacy where I think we could get really a lot smarter. The other area of opportunity as we break down this multi-dimensions is, is around training. This is the final area of possibility and, and perhaps is the most basic, but one that all of us can empathize, empathize with. Adequate training on the tools to ensure that we can use them effectively. You can have access, equipment, and privacy, but if you can't use the many tools, then what good is all this digital access? And if any of us has tried to help young people or senior people get onto the many complex software tools required to do online schooling or even access healthcare needs, we know that this is not easy. I can vouch, I have three kids at home and struggled to set up their learning management and courseware tools and access codes and passwords and internet tools. Um, how do you even maintain all that information um, in your house? And you can only imagine what this is like if you're doing it in a second language or in multi-languages. So what can we do as a local or regional community to help folks navigate this? Now, can we envision a countywide digital service core that offers mentoring projects, you know, like done at Big Brother and Big Sister or other mentoring opportunities to enable this young adult crowd to help out online training and et cetera? How about helping the coalition of educators in the Essex County learning community and helping them expand and amplify their professional development efforts to better prepare our educators across the county to best use all of these learning tools available. The professional development to help educators as these things change constantly to, to maximize their impact is ongoing. And what are the short-term interventions that can result in long-term gains? What are the quick wins? What are the small things we can do that can really have broad impact? So as we step back and we think about you know, all this opportunity, there is a lot of possibility and potential. If we work, across, work together across access, equipment, privacy, and training. And so my goal today, of course, is just to share some of these possibilities, some already happening right here in the county, many, many, many efforts, um, but most importantly, to inspire debate and discussion and encourage short and long-term, as well as local and regional aspirations and potential. This is the start. This is the start of our conversation. In addition to the, um, the sort of thematic analysis and, and summary analysis that Evan presented earlier uh, in the report, and we're going to be sharing that report, obviously, to everyone coming up, um, we also do a town by town analysis across all 34 towns and cities in the county. Um, and this dashboard shows both wired broadband access and computer ownership for each municipality. It also highlights underperforming subgroups and neighborhoods um, by noting, you know, as Evan did earlier, but down by town or city municipality, by noting where economically disadvantaged residents, Latino families, children, and seniors have below average rates in each of these different communities of wired broadband access um, as an example. It compares each community to countywide broadband rates for these subgroups that were identified earlier. So as an example, countywide rates of economically disadvantaged at 54.7% having access, Latino 70%, children 80%, and seniors 65%. How each town and city is doing against those county metrics. And when we look at these, we can see quite clearly that there's opportunities for all of us locally. Uh, as well as regionally, and even right in our own neighborhoods as we get into it. And, you know, there are some great data here that can help engage and excite each community, hopefully, to take action and to mobilize. 
we'll be sharing that. And for those that want a lot deeper data, we can also offer that sort of full data set also. So as we wrap up here in the next steps and we jump into questions and answers, I just wanna sort of remind everybody then that uh, today is just the start of the conversation. This is a, an analysis and a report, a summary of what we're learning today um, that we wanna share with the community. Um, but the goal is to create more discussion, more dialogue and enthusiasm across the county and across all sectors, municipal, nonprofit, state, for-profit, and philanthropy. And first, we're gonna go ahead and share the report and the data, and the report is in both English and Spanish. Um, so we'll be making that available, and we hope that you can share it with your community and your community change makers. Um, we'll be providing that uh, sort of countywide. Um, and for those that, as I said before, want more specific data, please reach out to ECCF and, and uh, we'll share that. Um, and then one of our first steps, um, you know, is to gather more information, more detail from you all to document all of the great work that is happening. So we're gonna be doing a survey um, that's gonna be coming out right after this um, uh, conversation today, um, you know, to gather some of this information more specifically around some of the great work that is happening right now um, and this is critical for us. Um, and the survey is meant to be very simple. I and mean, we ask that you take just a few minutes to share your ideas and thoughts, um, because this is critical for us to start to create that community asset map and to start to inventory the good work that is happening right here on the digital divide. And you know, this is part of our larger systems approach. Beth talked about this earlier, and this is the way that we've approached other challenges in, in economic development and arts and culture um, and disaster relief and uh, after the Columbia gas effort and disaster relief with COVID. This is the way that we, we do our process. This is our methodology um, where we start with the data to fully understand the current state. Um, and then we gather more detail on what is working and happening to understand the roles and the functions of our current system better. Um, and then identify leverage points um, or root cause areas that we can help invest in and then amplify and then work more regionally together to really tackle those bigger issues. And so that's where we are in the process, you know, is if we just share this data and we move down the path. And this is a process um, and we look forward to determine, you know, where we as a community foundation, what our role can be and how we can best help in this larger uh, complex uh, ecosystem. So I'll just finish up by saying, you know, start your engines, you know, let's get going. Let's start thinking about this and, and reflect upon what we can do again locally uh, and regionally. And we'll stop there and we'll open up um, for some questions um, and, and really get you know, deeper into the, the conversation here. Uh, thank you again for your time this morning and, your, and in your interest in this critical topic. Um, so we'll now open it up and take a few questions. Um, Evan, Beth, myself, others uh, from ECCF can be available to answer those questions. Um, and, uh, and I think uh, part of the team, Kate Mache and others have been monitoring the chat and any questions or comments that we have. Um, Let's let them fly. Great. Kate, go ahead. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I think we can start with the data specific questions. I just wanna thank everyone for um, composing and giving a lot of feedback and a lot of various different questions. So I'll collate some of them on the data sets and then move into some others. Um, for the specific questions, that's what the survey is gonna be for. Uh, you can indicate that in the comment box where if you have something specific that you feel like didn't get addressed, you can address it there. So the first one, if that's all right, we can move to Evan. Um, we had a question on how much and how well does the data differentiate between smartphone access and your PC Mac access? So just in, in terms of how you gather that data, Evan, would you be able to clarify that for us? Yeah, so at the county level, it differentiates extremely well. There, uh, those are separated out in the census survey. Um, do you have ac uh, internet access or broadband access through your phone, or do you have it through cable or fiber, or do you have it through DSL? Um, at the town level, they're not as differentiated, but we can use what we learned at the county level to impute the numbers for the towns, which is what we did. So the town numbers are adjusted, so they reflect um, just the cable or fiber fixed uh, broadband as opposed to cell broadband. Um, and we use the county numbers to, to do that. Thank you, Evan. The, um, the other thing. Kate, I, I lost you. Sorry, I am I, uh, an issue with my microphone, so I apologize if there's any issue uh, hearing me. Okay. But thank you for that, Evan. Um, 
I think there's a lot of different feedback on um, desirability for different data sets. Um, so if, if, if folks want to um, fill out your surveys and indicate what those are, and then we can pass them over to Evan to take a look at, would that be okay with you, Evan? Oh man, I'm excited about that. Um, you know, and any, anytime you're undertaking a project like this, you have to sort of focus on a certain selection of data to the exclusion of others that might be really interesting. Um, so the opportunity to go back into the kind of wide world, uh, yeah, that'd, that'd be great. great. And I think it's probably something we should have mentioned earlier, but to state the obvious, right? This is not a comprehensive study of all things digital across every single part of the county. Um, you know, it's really meant to sort of set the table and start the conversation and dialogue and sort of say, what else do we need to know? What more data do we need? Uh, what, what's happening that we should know more about? What are some areas that we need to explore more? So that's exactly the, the purpose of today. So that's great, Kate. And I think there's a lot in the chat um, for us to take away and go back and look at. And um, so we appreciate everybody sharing all that's in the chat. Um, as I'm looking at a number of these, um, there's a lot of ideas and solutions that are out there that we all need to discuss and talk about. Some have limitations as people are responding to each other's chats. <clears throat> but the dialogue starts here. So um, thanks for sharing. Great. And I, just to build upon that, Beth, for, for both you and Stratton, um, there are folks that are already working on solutions in their communities or, you know, within their organizations um, to address the digital divide. Um, what can they do to help? You want me to take that? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Yeah, I mean, it's a great, it's a great question. And, um, and, I, and thanks for bringing it up, Kate. Um, you know, our goal is to catalyze this conversation. And so we're going to be reaching out again through the survey initially, and then reaching out in other sort of small groups and one-on-ones and seeking folks that, that uh, A, have more information and insight into this that we can capture and bring together. And then also looking for partners to help us um, as we, we try to sort of catalyze around a focused effort in the county um, to, you know, try to solve some of these bigger issues. You know, our aspiration is if we can identify some of these root causes, can we sort of work together and develop a bigger um, uh, sort of collaborative effort to really sort of tackle some of these systemic issues? Or can we paint a bigger vision and aspiration that can even go out and raise money to help sort of fund a lot of this different work? So, um, you know, certainly... Um, you know, there's many di different ways that organizations can participate, sharing data, sharing information, becoming a partner and helping us in this work, um, and, and uh, continuing to educate us also as we move forward. That'd be my quick answer, Kate. Excellent. Thank you. Beth, did you have anything to add? Nope. Stratton, Stratton said it all. Um, you know, we're, we're in the, we, we want to hear from people. Um, we want to have the dialogue um, and everything he said, I don't need to take any more minutes than that. Wonderful. And just building on that, um, because in the chat, we've seen a lot of folks offering solutions or things that they've already started doing, but there are also folks that are pointing out needs so that their organization or community has a need um, to address the divide in, in their area or their even their um, community. So what resources, uh, any advice on what I should do for these folks who would like to get access to these resources? Um, Stratton or Beth? Um, let, uh, let me start by um, just the, you know, the, the reason that this emerged is part of our COVID response um, efforts. And so um, we, we are, we are, we have resources um, for youth and education. So just to Quickly, um, we're currently reviewing grant applications that were submitted by September 30th um, for youth and education. There are a number of grant applications that we've received from um, nonprofits and school uh, districts that are actually tackling the digital divide as it relates to our youth and our education systems. So you will probably see us announce those grants coming out um, the beginning of November. Um, those are resources we, we currently have um, that we have raised with our COVID response fund. Um, what we need to determine next is the appetite for funders who are interested in, um, in making equity in the digital divide. Um, so striving for equity in this piece and where we go as a community foundation, that's still yet to be determined. And those conversations need to happen now that we have the data 
to be able to show what the challenges and needs are. Um, so um, we're making small investments with resources that we currently have. The bigger investments um, are really something that we need to explore and, and set a strategy around and whether or not fundraising dollars um, are, are, you know, if funders are interested in this work with us, we need to have those discussions um, and we need to have those discussions um, quickly now that the data shows what we all, I think all internally knew, um, but oftentimes the data is where we begin the dialogue with funders. Thank you very much, Beth. Stratton, did you have anything to add to that? No, I think that's that's absolutely terrific. And yeah, and um, and this is the start of the conversation. You know, I mean, I think that uh, there hasn't been a regional, um, you know, sort of effort or sort of perspective on, you know, the digital divide and digital equity. Um, and so this is the start of that conversation. A lot of great local work happening, um, but, you know, we need to figure out as a community foundation what our role is in, in sort of helping move that forward. Um, as a, a grantor, obviously, if we can, you know, have the funding and, and, and the money to do that, but also as connective tissue, bringing people together, um, you know, to sort of learn from each other and share learnings, um, as well as continue to educate themselves um, and on, on, this, on this topic and possible solutions on that front. Great, thank you very much. And I, and I think, you know, it, it's also encouraging everyone to fill out that survey, right? There are just so many great comments that we can't get to all of them. Um, but I know inequity and access to data um, are coming up a lot. Uh, so we will we will take those all back and then chat with Evan and Stratton and Beth to take a look at everyone's questions and reach out to folks as well. The other interest that, that, we, that I saw in the chat was on the um, telehealth access. And how does that how does that impact how is the phone different from um, you know and I think Evan had touched upon that earlier how is the phone access different from getting on the internet and doing telehealth where are we going with telehealth so I think there are a lot of different um, things that folks have have really pointed out that deserve exploring and further conversations. You know, I saw one comment there just from Peter Vandermark uh, I think it was. Peter who had it there, but uh, around sort of our systems approach again and just sort of getting clarity on that. And, um, and um, you know, in the last several years, obviously this has been a, a major focus of our community leadership is, is, is taking a sort of systems-based approach towards, um, you know, trying to solve some of these big issues across our county and identifying some of those big issues. And so um, I, I won't talk for hours on this topic, although many of you all know I can, um, but, but just to simplify it again, you know, as we think about sort of a systems approach, you know, the first thing we do is we start with the data. You know, we try to gather as much data as we can to understand the issue. That's a learning opportunity to really start to frame what is the issue, what are the challenges, and what are we actually talking about? Um, the next phase is sort of moving more into, you know, convening and gathering um, and identifying, um, you know, a little bit more about the system. You know, who are the so the participants, who are the roles, what are the activities that are happening, and starting to map out that system and identify, you know, both what's working well um, and can be amplified or expanded, and also where are the big gaps, where are the big challenges. Um, and once you get in beyond just the raw data, get into some of those nuances as we look at sort of the, the larger sort of uh, continuum of care or value chain, as we look at that map, uh, that sort of full systems map. And then the third step, as we sort of define a strategy of how we want to approach it, um, is an engaged um, effort from the community foundation. Um, you know, to you know, once we've defined that strategy and we define sort of what our role is, and sometimes we're the leader, sometimes we're a partner, sometimes we're a participant. We play a different role in each of the different systems efforts that we do. Um, but depending on that role, we want to really sort of commit to something for a longer period of time with larger amounts of money. Um, that can really be invested from a sort of a an investment mentality and a growth mentality um, versus just a patching mentality um, and really being engaged sort of thought partner through that process with our other community members that we're working with and organizations across sector um, to really get to the root causes of issues and then really sort of aspire to having more of a systemic um, and population level impact to it. Um, so it starts with the data, goes through more learning and gathering, and then really comes up with a solution that we hope um, really gets to the root causes and can have more of a population level impact. So, you know, we're early in the process with the digital divide, but we see it obviously that was it was came out as Beth said in our Think Lab as a critical issue. 
um, that, that's been a critical issue, but it's particularly exposed during COVID right now. Um, and now we're in the learning phase of trying to determine how we can best play a role in continuing sort of a, a countywide effort to tackle that issue. Can I, I just want to add, I'm watch, listening or reading some of the chats coming through. And again, appreciate them, keep them coming. Um, uh, you know, it, it's about, we believe strongly at the Community Foundation in public-private partnerships. Um, we think that that's where system change really uh, can happen and can accelerate. Um, and I think it might have been Jess on here who, you know, talked about policy and that philanthropy alone isn't going to solve this problem. And whoever stated that, I'm Sorry if I got that wrong. Um, you're absolutely right. And so part of our work is we it is the convening part, is the sharing, the listening, the learning, the dialogue, um, and making sure that the right people are at the table. And we need you to help us identify who those are um, so that we can have those discussions. I'll use an example. The inter, uh, Internet Essentials is in a lot of the chat in here. And what we learned in this is that some school districts do it really well. It's called a third party payer and, um, and the school will pay for the, you know, internet Comcast pays for the first two months. The school picks up the tab for the other remaining four months for six months. That's a short term solution. It's not a long term solution and it's not for everybody because you have to have not had a faulty account with Comcast before. And so, it's piecing things together um, and it's looking for short term, um, uh, you know, measurement points, but a long term strategy. That's part of the discussion of systems change is how do we invest in things immediately pilot and, and, and where we can scale, but how do we also think about how do we get to the longer term um, challenges. And so the right people at the table, the data the right people at the table discussing that data, and then the the, the public-private partnership of, of um, philanthropic dollars with municipal dollars and federal dollars and all the players working towards a common goal. That's what we're hoping to achieve at the Community Foundation. And again, we could talk about this for hours. So I will be quiet. Is there, are there any other kind of questions, Kate? I think the, the rest are just pointing out everything, um, all the different areas in which we could get involved. One thing that, that I will just um, highlight for folks is that um, someone had just pointed out that you might have broadband access, but you have multiple people in the household uh, and it, it becomes very difficult for um, to be to have the appropriate uh, internet speed and, and broadband speed. So that was one other comment that I would just, um, just add there is something to look at. Um, and remember, today is a, is a start of the conversation, um, and the goal is to create more discussion and dialogue and enthusiasm across the county. I saw a couple of notes in there uh, from Corey and others saying, hey, it got me thinking about something that I was thinking about before, and that's what we're trying to do to get people inspired and, and start thinking about this. Um, and again, as Beth said, across all sectors, this is municipal, nonprofit, state, for-profit. You know, uh, the providers need to be a big part of this conversation um, and philanthropy. Um, and again, we just want to thank you for your time and energy uh, in this, this morning uh, Zoom. And, um, and we will be in touch and continue this conversation going forward. Please reach out. Thank you all very much. Thanks all for joining us.